Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. In case you're wondering, my name is Marcus Evans. I'm lead pastor here in Crossroads Church. And I uh, just want to clarify with Joel, he has not left. He has not moved away. Somebody came real sad. It's like, what's, what's the matter? He goes, I heard Pastor Joel's leaving. I was like, hey, where's he going? Because I don't know where he's going. I said, no. I said, he's in Florida. He sold his house. He got an RV there in Kerrville. And uh, they're still coming here. And if he leaves, he leaves. That's okay. Jesus is still on the throne. He's not Jesus, okay? The beautiful thing is, is that, listen, this is how it works here. Uh, Joel is a gift to the body of Christ. And uh, thank God this is his home base. He gets to travel all over the world. And what we're, what we're really doing, we didn't know we were doing this, but we're actually piloting something, and we're encouraging other churches, uh, pastors, to take a rest. They need to take a rest. And so uh, uh, as time allows and doors open, he'll go and help other pastors. They leave, and Joel fills their, their spot. And that way the pastor gets away, and he's strengthened, he's encouraged, he's built up, and then he comes back home, and then he continues to do that here at Crossroads Church and helps us out. And then he does that in different churches. So it's a beautiful thing, and we're trying to figure out, man, this is something that churches aren't doing and they need to do, and we're helping them um, build you know, stronger churches throughout our country. So that's a blessing, and you guys are all a part of that. So y'all send him out there. And be, By the way, just to let you know, here's how we operate. I love Joel, and I love every single one of our staff members. We hold their heart close to us, but their hands are very loose. They're not ours, they're God's. And every single one of us are in seasons of life. I pray that all of our staff will stay with us the rest of our lives. We'll just do life together and have fun and enjoy. But somebody told me, a wise old man told me one day, he goes, Marcus, the people that you begin with will not be the people that you finish with. And I'm like, no, sure enough, I knew that. But that's okay. So we've always, uh, one of our core values is relationships rule. And so it's important for us to stay connected with the people that God allows uh, to bring over here. Amen. And Joel and Emily are just amazing people. We are in the middle of a series entitled The Gift Within Us. And I want to begin by talking about little Johnny. Little Johnny was watching his mom prepare a Sunday meal. And he noticed that mom would cut the ham on both sides uh, before she would put it in the oven. And little Johnny asked, goes, why are you doing that? He goes, why do you do that? And mommy's, mom said, goes, well, because there's a certain flavor that comes out of it that everybody likes. You like it. Everybody else likes it. Plus, also, my mom taught me how to do it that way. And so what did little Johnny do? He calls grandma, calls mom's mom, grandma, grandma. I'm over here with mom, and she's making this ham thing like he, she always does. But she said that you are the one that helped her you know, show her this. And why do you cut the ham that way? Why do you cut it on both sides? And he goes, well, little Johnny, the reason why, and she said the same thing that mom said, because there's a certain flavor that comes out of it. We like the juices. There's a flavor that's great. And he goes, actually, he goes, call your Nana, because Nana's the one that started all this. She taught us how to do that. So he gets on the phone, calls Nana. Nana, I'm over here and talking to grandma and mom, and mom, and they're saying that you started all this, how we cook ham. Why do you cut the ham on both sides before you put it in the oven? And Anna's laughing. She goes, little Johnny, he goes, the only reason I did that is because my pan was too short, too small. <laughs> and I had to cut on both sides so I could fit it in there. I thought that was hilarious. The point is, there are, there are things that we constantly repeat in our lives, and we do it because... It's just been handed down to us, and we never have taken the time to understand the why, the backdrop, the background of why that took place and why it takes place. You guys ever do that before? We've done that over and over again. So this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to receive communion. This is family day. Okay, I'm just calling it family day just because that just came up in my head right now. (laughs) Um, I haven't taken communion with you guys for a little while, and I wanted to receive communion with you guys today. But at the end of the service, we're going to do that. But what I want to do is share the backdrop, the background of when um, the Lord's Supper was actually initiated by Jesus himself. I think that once you understand that concept, you understand the, the, the backdrop of that, you'll appreciate it a whole lot more. And I think and I believe that you'll never, ever receive communion the same again. Amen. In light of this series, The Gift Within, uh, we're going to look at the greatest gift that Jesus ever gave to the disciples 
right before he went to the cross there at the Lord's Supper. It's called the gift of a towel. That's the title of this morning's message, the gift of a towel. You know, this past week, for those of you guys who don't know, my mom passed away a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. And so this grief thing is mine. It's like, really, it's like, it's, it's serious. And so um, had probably an hour or so of sleep last night. So if I fumble through my words, that's the reason why. And I'm sticking to that story and that's it. And, um, um, but I, I realized, I was thinking about mom and stuff, and I realized that the greatest gift sometimes, oftentimes, is not the gift that they give you monetarily. Not the stuff that they handed you, you know, with not the money, not whatever it is. The greatest gift that was given to me was the life that she lived before me. All of a sudden, those truths, those concepts, those actions are so buried deep in my soul that I find myself imitating those things that were um, initiated by her love and her who she was. And that's the same thing that happened to Jesus. This past week, I realized that, and I realized that Jesus did the same thing. We all have gifts. You guys all have gifts. Pastor Jeremiah, Pastor Joel talked about that the last two previous weeks. Those gifts, according to Romans, uh, um, Romans 8, I think, it says that those gifts are to be used. And let me tell you something about callings and gifts. One, um, they didn't come from you. They came from the Father. Amen. And they're not for you either. They're to serve others. Amen. And the third thing is that that calling and that gift is, is, is not future, it's now. In other words, once you understand what that passion is, start working at it now. Don't worry about, oh, here's the big plan. Here's the, he's not going to give you that whole thing. If God told me that I would be doing this when I was 19, 20 years old, there's no way I'd be doing this. It's too huge. So I just, you know, I figured out the, I was passionate for this. And so I just went out there. Next thing I know, here I am in this place. And it's a beautiful thing. And I'm just staying the course and God's got other things in store for my life. But some gifts within are publicized because we're just imitating those things that we saw in someone else. And I think this is what took place in the life of Christ in this story. Because once Jesus gave the gift of this towel to those disciples, they were forever, ever branded in their soul. No one could ever take that truth that was put on display that moment. But I want to begin with a question this morning. How would you conduct yourself today if you knew that tomorrow at 3 p.m., that would be the last time you would take your last breath here on this earth. What message would you share to those that loved you the most? What would you tell your dad? For those of you who have children, what would you tell your children? If you knew that tomorrow at 3 o'clock, that would be the time you would breathe your last. What would you tell your spouse? Who would you crank call? <laughs> what if not only you foreknew the time, but you also foreknew how you would die? That it would be a very, very tragic death. And you knew that ahead of time. And not only that, but you also knew the person who was going to commit it. Who would be involved in committing that. Tomorrow at three is your last day on this earth. And tonight at eight o'clock, that very individual that was going to betray you was at your house having supper. It's pretty intense, isn't it? What would you do? Would you hate him? Would you confront them? Would you oppose them? Or would you love them? That's pretty much the scenario in John's gospel, the 13th chapter. That's the backdrop of this scenario that Jesus was facing when this story takes place. Jesus knew this. He knew that that next day he would die. He knew that the betrayer was right there at hand. And because he knew that, the greatest gift that he would offer and give to the disciples and those he loved would be how he would live out that moment in history. And we'll take a look at that this morning and we're going to just be absolutely blown away. Even though he foreknew that, how he initiated that moment and that thing is just sealed and burned in my heart and in the hearts of those who were present at that time. The day before the bloodbath, the day before the crucifixion, it's a Wednesday. The scripture doesn't really say a whole lot about it. It was silent. 
But we know that Jesus and the disciples were there in Bethany throughout the day. Nothing is penned in scripture about that particular day. But there's a whole lot that's been premeditated about that day. Um, Jesus is preparing for a Passover meal. That's what they call the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. He's going to help the disciples. He's going to coach them through that whole thing. Judas himself is premeditating how he would betray Jesus and put him to death and murder him. The disciples are premeditating and they're planning how, who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom after Jesus left. A lot of premeditation going on. Thursday comes along and they're going to Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem and it's the Passover. Are you guys tracking with me? It's the Passover and the place. I've been over in Jerusalem with Pastor Joel and we've traveled around there and it, it didn't get pretty crowded. And that particular day, because it's Passover, it is absolutely filled and jam-packed with guests from all over the place. The crowds are shoving one another. The crowds are, you know, at the volume 10. And they're trying to get a glimpse at the master teacher who was walking there into Jerusalem. The spring sun is coming down upon every individual. And there's a sweat of perspiration on every single man's forehead. The dust is filling the streets. And because it's filling the streets, it's setting a layer of dirt upon a man's body. And the disciples themselves, they're a long way from home, so they're not, about, they're not about to go back and start all over and just go back to another place. They are there for the long haul. And man, just a splash of cold water or something refreshing, a glass of tea would be absolutely refreshing at that moment. Peter and John are going to this room to go prepare uh, for what they call a Passover meal. Jesus enters the gates of Jerusalem like an innocent lamb entering a slaughterhouse. He knew exactly what was about to take place. And that day, he would find no rest until they, they would lay his body in a tomb. It's the evening time already. They're in the upper room. And he's prepared. He understands. He's prepared to combat the devil. He's prepared to, conflict, to have conflict with the disciples. He's prepared for confrontation with Judas himself. And he's also prepared for the crucifixion that would come from the Roman soldiers. Jesus knew. The disciples, they enter into the room at that particular moment, one by one, and they begin to take their places around that table. Many of you guys have seen the picture of the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. It was something like that. And they began to take their place one by one. And in that room, there is a towel, there is a basin, and there's a pitcher of water. And any one of those disciples could have volunteered to do this, but no one did. And so suddenly, um, this is where chapter 13 of John's gospel, verses 1 begins. And we'll take a look at that. You, if you have an app here at Crossroads Church, uh, all those notes are in there. So you can take a look at that right now. In verse, verse 1, it goes something like this. Now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them. I love this passage. He loved, it's one of my favorite. He loved them to the very end. Aren't you thankful that Jesus loves us to the very end? Amen. You know what that tells me as soon as when I heard that? That tells me that there's an opportunity for him to withhold that love. But he chose not to take it. It said he loved them to the very end. You know why he did that? Because love... And God is love. Love never keeps a record of wrong. Amen. Love is not resentful. Love, even though he knew that those individuals that he was facing right there, in just a few hours, they would betray him, they would run away, they would all abandon him. Even though he knew that, he endured and he believed all things. Why? Because love believes all things. Love sees it bigger than what it is, right? Right? And Jesus, in that moment, he was the big boss. He had the title of a big boss. He was the godfather. He was the master teacher. He was the rabbi. And his actions that were going to be displayed that moment would speak a whole lot louder than the words that he had to say and than any title. It says he loves till the end. Uh, there's no expiration date with God's love. I know maybe some of you, including myself, we might have messed up. We might have did a stupid just yesterday. And we feel bad. We think that we were to go to church today, 
the roof's going to fall in. I've had that said to me many times. It's like, well, we're still here. You know why it's still here? Because God's love is everlasting. If you're still here, even though you've blown it, listen, his love is everlasting to everlasting. If you failed him, if you rejected him, if you did a stupid thing, it's not your end yet. He's not through with you. Why? Because your wrongs and my wrongs will never trump God's right and God's love. Never will. Never has and it never will. You remember Isaiah, the 40th chapter where it says, haven't you not known, haven't you heard that this is the everlasting God? He neither faints nor is weary. He gives power to the weak and those who have no might, he increases their strength. And to Jeremiah himself, he says, listen, I have loved you with an everlasting love, with loving kindness. I have drawn you to myself and I will rebuild you. And that's not only to, you can put your name right there. He's drawing you. Do you know why you're in church today? Because my, my aunt asked me to come. No, he drew you here. So quit trying to get out early. He loves you with an everlasting, everlasting love. That's who our God is. So we continue in that passage. That's just verse one. Verse two, it says, during supper though, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, it was a holy place. Jesus is about to speak. He's about to educate all of his disciples. And in the greatest education, educated moment of the master, there's also another scheme going on from the enemy. Isn't that the truth? Do you know where you find the greatest devils are in church? God is sowing the everlasting seed into people's hearts because it's the seed of God's word that breaks those addictions, that breaks those habits, that breaks those things that we're so sick of. But in the middle of every single one of those places, you hear, uh, you know, the enemy's right there trying to distract you. A <laughs> little baby's crying. Or something's going on. Or you start thinking about your girlfriend or your old boyfriend. Or why is he so fat now? Or whatever. <laughs> why the enemy plays games like that? The scripture says when God sows the seed of the word, immediately the enemy comes in to try to take it out. And so right there in the middle of that holy place, in the middle of that great moment that we're going to look at here in a second, the enemy was in there inside Judas. He rose from supper, the scripture says, and he laid aside his garment. His outer garment, taking a towel tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped all around him. I love that passage. But before that, in verse 3, and let's go back to that place. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. How many things? All All things. Think about this. The Father had given Jesus everything. He was the most powerful person in that room. He had the highest title. He had all power, all dominion, all might, all strength. He could have easily called a legion of angels and destroyed all the scheme of the enemy, but he didn't do that. But what do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room? What do you do when you have the most authority and the most influential person in the room? Whether you're in your house, whether you're at work, whether you're the boss, what do you do with that kind of power? What do you do with that kind of strength? You know, not too long ago, I gave my grandson, uh, Hayden, I thought it was a $10 bill, but it was actually a $100 bill. And by the expression of his eyes, man, he was like, he thought that, man, Popo just gave me all things into his hands. <laughs> but the passage of scripture says that Jesus knew that the Father had given him all things. But what did Jesus do with that authority? What did Jesus do with that influence? What did he, what did he do with that, that the, 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 the might right there in that, in that moment? You know what Jesus did? He traded it. He traded his title for a towel. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments And taking the towel, he tied it to his waist. Now, let me explain. And, you know, I got this when I was in Jerusalem, and it's a a shawl. And I don't actually know how it's supposed to go on. But 
I'll just put it on like this. Okay. I got this from a rabbi, and he blessed it, and he gave it to me. I'm not a rabbi, okay, but you can take your pictures now if you want. <laughs> but it said he had an outer garment, and he took aside, he lay aside his outer garment. This is, these outer garments hold a lot of weight. If you walk around with a hat like this, a little rabbi, and a shawl like this, people are listening to you. They're watching you. You're a man in authority. You're a man of power. You have a title. You have some weight behind you. Does that make sense? There's a position. There's a ranking system. But what did Jesus do in that moment? The scripture says that he laid aside all of this authority, all of this power. He set it aside. He laid down all this strength, and he exchanged it for a towel. It's a servant's towel. Only those in the lowest positions would do this type of a duty. Delilah, can you come up real quick since you're right there? Emmanuel, can you come up? Sorry, Delilah. Can you grab a chair? Mm -hmm. It's okay. You can just put it right there. You can have a seat. And he gets on his knees and he takes this towel and he gets that base and he fills it with water and he takes his shoes off. I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> and he begins to wash this man's feet, the disciples' feet. He cleans it, washes it. The very hand that created the universe and with his finger created the mountains that we love to climb are now massaging a disciple's foot and cleaning it. And one by one, he did that. And he begins to just wipe it clean, wash it. The next one goes to the next one, goes to the next one. And he follows through. And afterwards, thank you. I should have taken him off. Yeah. <laughs> and afterwards, he lays it aside. The hand that shapes the stars begins to remove the filth. One grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the row. Only the lowliest servants do that. As I said, the fingers that formed the mountains are now washing toes. And the towel before his death becomes the greatest gift of action the disciples would ever see. And it would be branded forever in their soul. And as he went, disciple by disciple, that white fabric turned black and brown with soil. And when he was doing that, every single disciple would begin to break, to be filled with shame. Peter would be outraged. Thomas would become suspicious. But the message would be clear. Others before self. It's actually the gospel message. We were dirty. We were filthy. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even though he knew that, he knew that about those who were in that room, he still bowed himself down to serve us and give his life to cleanse us and to wash us. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And the feet that were washed by his towel in just a few hours, those same feet would be running away from the sword of Roman soldiers. They would take the path of least resistance and run and run. And there would be only two set of footprints who would remain there when he was hanging up on the pulpit of that cross. It would be James, the beloved, and his mother, Mary. Everyone else, they would deny him. They would be scattered. And the next day when those disciples would look down upon their own feet, their hearts would be shamed with guilt. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that Judas would condemn himself to death. But what Jesus wants them to remember is this. Listen. Before you did any of those things, before you ran away, before you betrayed me, before the rooster crowed and you denied me, Peter, 
before you hid yourself from those Roman soldiers and lied, I forgave you. I served you. Why? Because mercy always triumphs over judgment. The towel always triumphs over a title. Love always wins over fear. He fulfilled not only his role as a servant, but he fulfilled his role also as a savior to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's who our God is. That's who my father is. That's who your savior is. Oh, and it doesn't stop there. In verse 12, it says that when he had washed their feet, he put back on the outer garments and he resumed his place. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. And then the master begins to teach, and he gives him the gift of this towel lesson. In verse 14, it says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, I need you also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you a what? An example. That word example means an exhibit. An exhibit for the purpose of imitation. I am giving you this as an example so that you could do to others like I have done this to you. Man, what a powerful moment. What an absolutely crazy moment in that moment in history. And the message is, Delilah was here and we have student ministry in, on Wednesday nights and this is one of the principles, this is one of the core values that we teach our students, others before self. Take the lower position and build others up. And the message is, is very clear. He did it while they were in that place. He did it before they even did any of those things. And the message is always, God's message to you and to me is always, I am for you. I am with you. I'm about to lay my life down for you. I'm not mad at you. Do you believe this? We have a hard time believing the goodness of God, don't we? Well, Peter did. Because all of a sudden, the gift of a towel turned into a test. And Peter didn't pass. It tests all mankind to the root of our selfishness. It examines every single one of us. It places us on trial and every single one of us will be found guilty before God Almighty. Notice what happened in, in, in Peter's life. Right there in the next verse, it says in verse 6 through 11 in chapter 13, it says, he came to Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, what I am doing, you don't understand now, but you will know after this. He didn't pass the test in that moment. He passed it later, though, and fulfilled his calling in his life. As a matter of fact, 37 years later, uh, Nero came and put Peter to death. And history says that they were going to crucify him. But before they crucified him, Peter said, no, don't crucify. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my master. Turn me upside down. And they crucified him upside down. And Crossroads Church, it's a, it's a simple message. And, I, and, and it feels like it's, so quiet in here. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> come off that way, but it's just like, I'll never forget this moment. Even though I wasn't there, I feel as if though I am. Because when I experienced Christ at 19, I was overwhelmed by his goodness. I was overwhelmed by his love. As a matter of fact, it was so overwhelming, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think I was worthy of it. And we're not. But that's what mercy is. Mercy gives what we don't deserve. And thank God for that. Amen. Amen. So may you and I always remember the gift of a towel. He traded that title, that authority, the power, and he bowed down on his knees to serve us. He set aside his title to serve humanity, to clean our dirt. This act of service, he resumed his title and then they gave him a name above every name and that every name, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And every single one of us will come to a place one day when we will see him face to face and we will bow our knee before the one who's worthy of being bowed to. And we can either do it while we're here on this earth or we can wait until we leave this earth. And I would encourage you to do it while you're here on this earth. It's so much better, amen? So the test is on us. Will you allow him to cleanse you? Will you allow him to free you? Will you allow him to, will you receive his cleansing? For us who are followers of Christ, will you begin to 
serve others as he gave us an example of how to serve. Let me close with this passage of scripture in Philippians. It's an easy translation, but I love it because it's so easy. It makes so much sense. It says in Philippians 2, don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave and became human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God lifted him up and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ. And call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Isn't that powerful? I love that passage so very much. So here's my challenge to you. It's my challenge to me. After just reading this and just writing this last night. What outer garments need to be removed from my life, from your life, so that we can begin to serve others? What titles that you have that you're holding on to need to be set aside. The title of a pastor, set that aside, Marcus, so that you can serve the congregation. So the title of head of the house, set that aside so that you can love on your kids. The title of one spouse or another, set that aside so that you can serve the one that you committed to and made a covenant with. That the title of, a, of being a Christian, lay that down and begin to serve your community and be an example of what Jesus did to us, we, do, we should do for them. Amen? Amen? What will you do with the gift of a title? If you're not a follower of Christ, if you never bowed down your heart to the Lordship of Jesus, will you allow him to cleanse you today? Will you receive the cleansing? Or will you just remain in that stained and soiled guilt and shame of sin? For those of us who are following Christ, we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the scripture says. But daily, how many guys know that we get dirty? We mess up. I know, I took Manuel's shoe off. He gets dirty. (laughs) Daily, we mess up in different ways. There's frustrations, we fall. And you know what God has offered us? And how we are supposed to get back up when we have those moments in our life? You know what he's offered us? Communion. Communion the breaking of bread. And so that's what we're going to do today. We are going to break bread. We're going to receive communion as a family. And whenever we take that bread, we're reminded of the body that was broken for us. Whenever we receive the juice, the wine, we're reminded of the forgiving power of God, how he's cleansed us, how he continues to wash us, how our sea, our sins are thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. That's what communion is, folks. That's why I say the gift of a towel was something that was just, every t- I do this a lot, often, almost daily. Every time, every Sunday morning, I, I come in here and I'll go straight to receive communion. Why? Because I'm so unworthy, but he made me worthy. And so I learned to receive. I learned to receive. I learned to receive God's goodness, God's mercy, God's cleansing all the time. Do I mess up? Man, I might be in the newspaper tomorrow. Who knows? But I know if I am in the newspaper that next day, I'm going to receive God's grace and God's forgiveness. It doesn't give me a license to sin. As a matter of fact, it does the opposite. I'm so overwhelmed that his mercy and his love that I don't want to do those things. I want to stay the course and finish my race with joy. Amen? Amen? What title needs to be set aside in your life? If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.